Ron. Hello. Welcome to your own home where I am very pleased to be visiting and doing an interview with you about FIE and its 20th anniversary and your role in making that happen and getting it started and a little bit about your role in the whole field of study abroad, which I know you don't want to talk about. Well, but you're going to. A little bit here and there. A little bit here and there. Yeah. So my guest today is Ron Kane, and I'm Joan Gore. And this is the year of the 20th anniversary for the Foundation for International Education. And Ron was there at the beginning, taking risks along with a lot of other good people to try to build a really strong organization. Ron has been in this field for a very long time. He's very modest. He doesn't want to speak, so every now and again I'm supposed to kick him, and that will help him speak. There you go. Um, but I will say that Ron is one of the people in this field who's created new models of programming and made models work. Um, and I think it's important to talk about that at the start. For me, Ron is the person who really helped community colleges in this country, in the United States, understand that study abroad could be something for their students, and you helped build programs with their faculty and found fiscally reasonable ways for students to study abroad. You really began high quality short term programming with many of these institutions, and it's had a huge impact on our field, and something you're too modest to talk about, but about which you should be very proud. So what I would like to do is talk a little bit about, about your early days in this field and how you got into the field and why, um, and eventually how you got to FIE. So let me ask you, first of all, you were a music teacher. I was. So how, what happened to you that you moved from that job, which I know you loved, and music, which I know you continue to love, to the field of international education. What was that trajectory? Well, it was primarily uh, the experience I had taking my choirs to England mm -hmm. and performing, uh, giving them the opportunity to perform in the great cathedrals of that country. And that gave me a first-hand uh, notion that this is a very important thing for young people to do. I continued teaching music, but little by little, I began taking other groups around the world, uh, usually summer, three, four or five mm -hmm. week summer programs. And I began working very closely with some of the more uh, legitimate study abroad programs a semester and, and year long and I was convinced to let music be part of my past and I very willingly did that because I, I, I kind of uh, became used up as it were in that field and I was ready for something new and that all happened in 1974 wee bit of time back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, uh, and I never, I never had any regrets. I really haven't. I, mean, I, had a, I had a full plate with music for 18 years, performed musicals, and did concert tours, and loved being a secondary school teacher. Uh, but I, I was finished in 1974. And what did you do in 1974? Where did you end up starting your international education career? Actually, I started with a company that no longer exists. It was the Foreign Study League, which uh, worked out of Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of them? I was with them for three years and worked with some incredible people. Uh, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking of Tom Hansen and, and Tom Jones and, uh, well, the list goes on. And I was with them until another organization uh, took over. 
And that, of course, was AIFS. Right. And I was with them for, I think, 18, 19 years. And that's actually how I met you. And that's where we met. That's right. right. I right. left the University of Virginia and joined AIFS, and you were my guide and mentor in that whole field. Well, actually, in my, my work was mostly on the secondary level, even with them. And the college university work didn't begin until the early 80s, about 1982. Okay. And that was when I was in California. So, was it a big shift to move to college, international ed? Well, it was pretty, pretty scary because I was pretty successful with the high school levels. And it was one way to keep my job. I had to create something for myself in California. And that's when I began working with the uh, semester abroad idea. Right. Not that students would study only for a semester, but the actual faculty from the institution would be the teachers of right. their students, and these students would then receive resident credit from their home institution. And right. that became a Cal State University uh, program. And that model was a model that both involved faculty-led programming, faculty development, exposing faculty to yep. overseas education, obviously student programming, but it also involved a structure surrounding it that made sure students had opportunities for understanding, experience, and exposure to educators from yeah. the United Kingdom, in that case, it initially. Was, yeah, it was essential. There are a lot of details that had to be worked out in order to keep the accreditation people at, at ease. Right. Uh, because this was a little bit new and a little jarring for them. to. But they checked out in every way, and literally hundreds of students responded to that model program. One school that I remember in particular, Cal Poly SLO, sent over 200 students and 10 faculty at one time. And that was something that continued. In fact, I think AFS still has some of those programs still going. They do, yes. Yeah. Uh, but that, that also led to the community college. Right, and that was a very new activity in the field of study abroad. That was very new. It was like going to these schools and they say, who, us? We don't do that. Right. And I said, well, let me give you a chance to, uh, let, me, let me explain how you can do that. And the faculty got so excited, they just went out and hustled with students in China and helped them understand what a special opportunity this was. Right. Well, it was an overwhelming response again. Right. And it spread all over the state of California and now around the country, right. of course. Right. So uh, community college is just as valid a, an institution for study abroad as any other. Of course. Yeah. And, uh, and as I said initially, I think that's something about which you should feel very proud. Well, I was very satisfied. And yeah, I guess there's, I'm a little bit proud of that because it was, I, I tend to have a little creativeness in me in that that satisfied that urge. To be creative. To be creative in the work. And certainly AIFS was a very strong organization and, and really grew in strength during those years. There, yes, they certainly did. And there's a lot of uh, growth that took place in London with AIFS. Right. They bought study centers. They had to expand their whole right. operation in London because so many students were flowing in from these uh, West, West Coast colleges. So you worked with the IFS through those years to help them get established very strongly in the college. In the college division, right. Right. Yeah. And then you went to, with a good friend of ours, Jerry Thompson, who is also yes. uh, someone I met at AIFS. The three of us, following Jerry really, went to CIEE, which was right. again a very different organization. And there you worked with programs all over the world. I did, and it was it was a short term with CIE. I was there for three years, but there was some internal changes being made to right. the administration, and, and the decision was made to not continue the kind of position I had or with a few, a few of us had, which was called field right. directors. And uh, but before I left CIE, I I hope I left uh, some startup programs here and there. That you certainly did. That brought them into the field. Right. Yeah. And, and what I'm leading to is your career trajectory to FIE. 
because um, without mentioning age, right. um, you had already worked for almost 20 years before you even got into this field. Right. And um, you only retired two years ago. One so, year. one year ago. I'm sorry, one year ago. Oh, 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 yeah. That's right, one year ago. So you have been in this field for a very long time, and you've made contributions to a number of organizations. I know that you went after CIEE to the university. I went to a university in Iowa. It was a full departure from everything I had been doing before, but it was not a very happy relationship. There were, uh, this was a, a Japanese effort to bring their students and put them in these two Iowa schools, the West, right. Westmar and Barry Crest. But it only lasted two years, and I won't go into the Right, but the, it was problems. an experiment that you were trying yeah, to Yeah, it was an experiment, but it just, it just wasn't a good fit. And so... And then that, I left that and uh, moved to the mountains in California and waited for Whatever, whatever was next in the plan for me. Right, as you might have said yourself, yeah. you were waiting to see how things would unfold. That's right, and thank goodness, thank God they did. Uh, and one wonderful call from Pete Loiner. Yes, and talk about Pete and who is he? Pete Loiner became the first, well he was with Richmond College for a long time. Which is related to AI yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he asked if I wanted to help them to develop a new study abroad organization in London. And being Pete, I of course took it very seriously. And he mentioned Sharif's name. And this and, is, say, Sharif's full name, if you would. And some of the other people that I highly regard, like John Pearson was part of that, right. that, that first uh, uh, group. And uh, John Makey very quickly came on board, right. and we all of a sudden, we had our hands on a pretty dynamic group of people. You London. did, and tell me a little bit more about each of these people. Pete Loiner um, was president at FIE and went right. on to other study abroad organizations before he retired not that long ago, and so he no. certainly has made a very successful contribution to the field. Oh yeah, I'm a great guy. And tell me about a little bit about Sharif, and what, who is Sharif, and who was Sharif, and what was his role? Well, Sharif graduated from Richmond What College. is Sharif's last name? I knew you'd say that. Wrong. Mohazen. Mohazen, right. Mohazen. Sharif That's right. Mohazen. And uh, he, he graduated from Richmond and worked, worked out a way to purchase a building for, to house students. Okay. And using that investment that he made, uh, we were able to begin talking about a study abroad. Or, if you're going to bring them to London, you've got to put them somewhere. And, and he, he purchased some very, very... Uh, uh, extraordinary buildings in Kensington and our job was to fill those beds as quickly as possible for obvious reasons. Because of the cost. The of, cost was, uh, was enormous. Bedding and rooms, yes. So, so Sharif asked if I, help, <laughs> if I could help him do that and I said well that's what I do. I, I would be proud to you know, do that for people like you and John Pearson. And so Sharif was interested in not only delivering housing, he was really interested in building a study abroad programming and the housing was a tool in that process. Yeah, it was, it was a, perfect, a perfect storm, as it were, right. to have the housing and then to have an organization, kind of a, a sister organization that was a student study abroad organization that uh, one, this by the way, became a nonprofit arm. Right. And uh, to have students come to that study abroad organization and not have to rent their rooms Outrageously from London priced. Landors, Right, exactly. Know, we had our own way of uh, offering the student tremendous value. Right. To have uh, control, of, control of everything, no landlords for those students. We were the ones that took care of them. Right. Totally. So you could build, there were two arms to the organization, the, the housing arm, right. and then uh, the, for, the non-profit study abroad arm, right. the Foundation for International Education. Right. And this means you had housing, and you had a study abroad and we had a study structure, center. and you had a 
fabulous study center uh, right in the heart of Kensington. But of course you had no colleges, students, or, or American partners. So to me, this is a really terrifying prospect. Mm -hmm. So Everybody was scared to death. What was the strategy? What, what did you all talk about, about what you wanted to build in London and how you wanted to make it work in the United States? Well, what we had to do was bring something to the American colleges and universities that they were a little bit familiar with. Mm -hmm. And they were familiar with people like John Makey. They were familiar with people like John Pearson. John Pearson and also John Makey, and John Makey had been in this field for many, many yeah, John years. John was with Richmond, John Makey was with uh, AIFS, and well, he's very, very well known. As a, as a faculty London, member, as a faculty very member, highly respected. Probably yes. one of the finest London historians we, that I know. Right. Anyway, that was the, I had to bring something to some of my old friends and clients, deans and presidents of colleges. And I'd walk in the door and they'd say, hey, I thought you were done with that. And I'd know, this is why I'm back. Right, and John Pearson was part of that group too. Absolutely. And the, and the same folks who knew John Making knew John Pearson. You had to drop those names in order to get their attention. Because they knew they were people of quality. Well, not, yeah, they're the best. Yeah. Absolutely the best in what they do. Right. So that's, uh, and we fortunately, within months, I don't know if I can mention the schools, uh, Cal Poly. I think you should mention yeah. the schools that helped to get this started. Yeah, Cal Poly, uh, San Luis Obispo, uh, decided to take a chance with it, and they were, they put together another large, large group of students and then um, I went to a community college, Mount San Antonio College, mm -hmm. and they sent a large group of students. So that's all you really needed in the beginning was to get some of these beds filled and then prove and show how good you are. So when you're showing how good you are, we talked about the fact that you could deliver unusually high quality and secure housing. On the study abroad side, what were you doing to deliver quality? Well, we, first of all, you got to remember that the faculty belonged to the U.S. institution, right. and they were the on-site evaluators of how we were doing our job. Right. And we would hire faculty in London. British faculty. British faculty. Mm -hmm. And uh, the American faculty would work with them and we would be also having a student life team of players who would take care of students outside of the classroom. Right. And that along with the, the, the high level of commitment that came from everyone uh, during a full semester, the, it, it didn't take long to get the message back. I would get a call or two, come visit us, Ron, we'd like to hear more about what we hear. Right. And that's when things really started opening up. Right. And schools all over the country, and with, with the help of Erica Richards in right. the East, mm -hmm. she was incredible in bringing some of these people to follow into this high quality opportunity. Right. My reason for going back into study abroad was because this is the finest way to go back to it, because everything. Everything took a step up, right? And the the, the uh, well, the story I hope has revealed itself over the last twenty years, right? And it certainly today is a, a very very large and very successful organization, and many of those first schools continue to work Still directly that. with them today. Yeah. And it has a very robust structure of uh, academic and extra or, uh, and co-curricular activities as well. But it was not always easy. And you began in 1998, officially? With AI, with, with FIE. With FIE. Yeah, yeah, FIE. And, um, and then in 2001, we had 9-11. Yep. So along the way, there were some real challenges. Mm -hmm. As they continue. As they, and they, yes, and as they certainly continue today yeah, in different yeah. forms, and, and the whole world yeah, faces yeah. them. Um, 
as you were growing, did 9-11 impact your growth at all, or did it not? It's interesting how American students are not scared off very easily. And if, if I remember right, uh, there wasn't the impact we thought there would be. Even when there were bombings in London, there was a certain uh, willingness to get close to it and learn through it and mm -hmm. by it. Mm -hmm. So that these tragedies almost was a motivating factor mm -hmm. to learn more about how these things are happening in the world. And study abroad does that for students. And we have a very, very conscientious uh, emergency program that John Pearson, he's, he's absolute brilliant, right. and John Pearson uh, put together that uh, gives the confidence the parents need right. when things like that can happen. Right. So what you found then was that not only did not the program did not decline, it actually continued no, to grow. Continued to grow. There was not a decline. Right. Maybe a little flattening out, but nothing that right. was noticeable. Right. And and that continues today. And we yeah. all know, of course, yeah. um, you know, the issues everywhere. The United yeah. States everywhere. Well, it's a different world now, absolutely. Right. And we have to live accordingly and uh, along with it. And I think that's what FIE always tended to do. Right. Uh, to, not, uh, to not ignore it and to not uh, be scared off by it, but to find ways of developing programs that would learn, help learn about it and how it learn. And recognize what the world was and what it needed. Yeah, in, in other words, the students came back and understood much more about how these things happen. Right. And I think uh, FIE itself developed a series of principles and missions that also grew out of some of this, including certainly um, peace, social responsibility, studies, etc., that have been very integrated into their growth and development. Absolutely. Yeah. So, do you remember by any chance roughly how many students you had the very first semester? Just a round number? I think days. around 300. Okay. Yeah. We thought that was great. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I remember Sharif wanting, the magic number he wanted, I think, was 800. Right. And we thought, well, then we did, well, we can do that. And it wasn't long we did have that many students. That's right. That and had, today it's really pretty much double that. Oh, yeah, yeah it is double that. Yeah. yeah. And, then, you know, there's a point where uh, we're, we're happy now, I think, we're not that we don't welcome more students, but... We're quite happy with the way things are going right now because we're taking good care of everybody. Right, and there's a niche that you fill in in the higher education international market. Well, it's harder you now. Feel than, well. Yeah, but it's harder now than ever. I, in a way, I'm one of the hardest things I ever did. By the way, was retire. I know. I'm not a good retirer, but one of the best things that is 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 happening is. Uh, I'm forgetting what, I just turned 84, by the way. Very young. So I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting what I was going to say, but, uh, but the study abroad what, it, that, what, is becoming what is more difficult, difficult now yeah. because of the, well, competition is one thing. There's so many good programs all over, but the price is going way, way up. Right, and, and, it's, and it's a struggle. To and it's, it's harder than ever to uh, convince people that this is an important thing to do. So uh, I was great, I am grateful that I had my beginnings when I did, that there were some ways of doing things that hadn't been tried yet. And I was there and in on it and trying. It's pretty hard to find new ways of doing things now because so much has been done up to now. I've been doing this for 52 years and starting at a time uh, when all you did was fill an airplane full of students and away you go. And uh, what was waiting for them was usually a travel group. And you just show them around. My first trip was 10 countries in six weeks. <laughs> 
Yeah. Wow, if I were taking young people to 10 countries in six weeks, I probably would have committed suicide. <laughs> yeah, well, we ended up in Russia, as a matter of fact. And no, that didn't occur to me at all. No, I enjoyed it, and that's really, that and my teaching in Asia um, really motivated me and right. made me go on. Well, I will say this, and that is that both you and I have now retired. Yep. And um, I share that passion that you I know have. You. Yeah. But I also feel like it's this younger generation out there now, and they're going to create new things. Yep. And I feel like we've contributed to them, and they are going to contribute to the whole field. So right. I think the field is going to change, and new things will develop. And I think FIE is, is certainly striving in that direction. They've certainly started. Um, some unusual programming, the a Peace and Conflict Resolution Program in Ireland and in Jordan that has, in very difficult times, actually been successful. Um, and uh, they have started a student leadership conference in London that has very proven good. very yeah, successful, right. reaching out to both British universities and American Study Abroad students. So I think there's a lot ahead. But I also think that what is ahead has been built on the foundation of what people like you did at the beginning. I would really like to ask you about a couple of other people. We've talked about John Makey and Pete Moyner um, and, and John Pearson. We've talked a little bit about Sharif. I would like to talk more about Sharif and then talk about others because Sharif took risks oh, yeah. and was willing to support an educational venture when it could not make money as I understand it, and it, it, it could not cover its own expenses, which is a huge commitment. Yeah, I remember how nervous he was now and then. He I would had, think so. And rightly so. Yeah. yeah. But he, he definitely needed the encouragement of some schools giving him the chance to show what he can do. Right. And that's what I hope uh, you, Eric, were help, Erica and you and I, Erica both helped yeah, to accomplish, very much so. That. That's right. You know, one, once you're started in study abroad, uh, you're, the essence of your, the work you do is, is one of growth yes. and, and uh, innovation. And that's like you said, today study abroad is different than it was. It's much more sophisticated and it's much more in-depth and it's continuing the growth it always had. Right. So that won't change. And I, and I mentioned before about the high prices. The high prices were just as high 50 years ago, relatively. You're right, right. You know, right, that's a good point. Yeah, actually. I think we have to remember that, that uh, what it costs to go to school now, uh, study abroad is compatible with that, that, that right, kind exactly. of investment. One of the things I wanted to mention, of course, in this process for FIE, was Sharif's sudden death. And that must have been very difficult for all of you. Well, it was hard to believe at first. I mean, right. And that such a young man left us so, so quickly. And <coughs> needless to say, we, we, had to, we had to stop and go deeply within to see how we were going to get along without him. Because right. he was really a strong leader. And fortunately, we had other strong leaders. Right. Uh, and Pete, of course, Pete Leiner. And then right after Pete, uh, Mike I Wolf hope. was a leader for our organization. And then, thank God, Hanya came along. And tell, say, explain who Hanya is. For the <coughs> Hanya is, uh, was, is a, a Sharif's widow. And she became the chairman and of the board. And she became the chairman of, of the board. And it turned out she had an extraordinary leadership ability, uh, taking, taking FIE to where it is today. Uh, I can't praise her, her enough right. for the leadership she provided. And we weren't sure that was going to happen at first. Of course. She, was, she too was a young person, yeah, a young woman, a and with girl. a small child and yeah. in a state of shock and loss. So, yeah. yeah absolutely. So I think there were, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of reasons why all these good things happened. But it was mostly in the kind of people that were involved with it. So another person that was there from the start, I don't think we've mentioned yet, was the housing side. And the housing side, yeah. London, London housing, I've always seen as a sport. <laughs> you know, like like a, a sport. It's yeah. like I was watching a TV 
really great tennis yeah. match or something yeah. of people trying to figure out how you match beds and human beings. And it is a, it's, it's one of the fundamental realities of study abroad that you have to have space. You cannot outprice the programs, right. and um, you have to you have to cover your expenses. And John Genuti has been was a critical person in Brilliant. all this. Brilliant, absolute genius in, in taking care of uh, the housing. So John led the other side, right? The the housing as he side. continues to do, right? And now, of course, FIE has control of four or five buildings. Yes. At least. Yes. <coughs> and Hanya, as chair, mm -hmm. has led in some unique renovations in those buildings, oh, so that there beautiful. is actually what they now refer to as a Kensington campus yeah. for FIE, and it is a reality of yeah. buildings located across this incredibly rich yeah. neighborhood of, of uh, culture, <coughs> museums, universities, etc. Well, those, the housing that we see today is not what we saw 20 years ago. It was a little bit, you know, needed, was, a little, needed a little work. Right. But, and but the students were well cared In for. a great neighborhood and safe. And the, yeah, the neighborhood was the same and everything was wonderful. But, but we, we had a little bit, do a little bit here and there. Right. And now you wouldn't even recognize. These buildings are amazing. They're gorgeous. They're it's gorgeous. I wouldn't mind living in a dorm room in London looking at Hyde, at Hyde exactly. Park and Kensington Park. Yeah. So that would be a very nice place to be. Mm -hmm. um, and there were younger staff too, Merch, Zara. Oh, Merch, yeah. She's some kind of from the beginning. And, right. And Zara do many, many things at once. Right. Brilliant little one. That she young was. staff who stayed for the full 20 years. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and are still young, yeah. um, but have made the organization grow. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's, it's a wonderful story. Very glad I was part of it. Well, I, I, I know I speak on behalf of FIE in saying that um, FIE was privileged to have you be a part of it, and they were very grateful to you. Well, thank, you. thank you. And I thank you for this interview because Ron told me he wanted to hold a book up, the title of which was Silence. Silence Speaks. Yeah, something like that. That was it. He was gonna when I asked the first question, he was going to hold the book up. It was going to say "Silence Speaks Best," and yeah. my career as an interviewer was about to come to a, a really crashing end. But it didn't. <laughs> it instead has produced a wonderful conversation with a man who made an enormous contribution to a wonderful organization celebrating its 20th anniversary. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Whoops. <laughs>